Let me first say what a great honor it is for me to be part of this celebration of our dear friend and colleague, Carrie Polanyi Levitt, in recognition of the awarding of the Iphigenia Martinez Prize by the Faculty of Economics at UNAM in Mexico, and to do so in the company of good friends and colleagues from Mexico, from the United States, and of course from Canada. Um, I must say that the discussion is very timely because as we are talking here, uh, the three NAFTA amigos, or should I say former amigos, <laughs> are sitting down in Washington DC to renegotiate NAFTA and that's going to be the subject of one of our presentations, so it's very timely. I believe we are at a time of great transition and I'd ask as we go into this panel, does the present conjuncture portend the end of neoliberalism as we've known it for the past three decades? And if so, will it be succeeded by an era of greater equality and stability? Or on the other hand, will other forces prevail, the forces of reactionary populism, and I'll say it, fascism, that erupted in the streets of Charlottesville over the weekend. So we live in a fraught time, but I believe our panelists are well equipped to tackle some of these issues, and my job is simply to help them to do it within 20 minutes. Um, so I will brandish um, a five-minute note uh, sign that uh, will warn them that their time is uh, going to end in five minutes. So let me just start by introducing Carrie Polanyi Levitt. I've had the pleasure of knowing Carrie over the past 30 years, and I'd like to say a couple of things because I'm sure she's also going to be introduced later on this evening. But Carrie, as we know, had a very inspiring parent uh, in the shape and form of her father, Carl Polanyi, whose legacy Carrie has worked very hard to build over the past three decades. Perhaps less well known is that she was also inspired by her mother, Ilona Duchinska, who is a distinguished journalist, engineer, historian, and revolutionary. So these were formative influences on Carrie as she was growing up. Also, I thought it might be interesting because some people might not know that uh, Carrie's very ver varied career over the, the decades has included, among other things, being a technical economist. She's worked on input-output tables. She's worked on economic statistics. She's worked on national income accounts. These are very much part of um, Carrie's career track. But perhaps she's best uh, known for her work on development in the Caribbean and on aspects of Canada's economic policies. And I'm thinking here of her famous book, which was republished uh, a little while ago now on uh, silent surrender, uh, multinationals uh, and the takeover of uh, Canada. In Canada, she's been recognized for her contributions to the establishment of international development studies as an interdisciplinary field for which she was awarded the Order of Canada in the year 2014. So Carrie, congratulations for this latest distinction from our Mexican friends, and please speak to us on Carl Polanyi for the 21st century. Kerry. I find it hard to find sufficient, to find the words 
with which to express my thanks to our Mexican, to my Mexican colleagues for the appreciation of my work to the degree that they undertook the translation of the whole damn book of collect collected essays published in 2013. Um, you must believe me when I say that what they have done in order to make this available to a Spanish reading audience and what lies behind that which is the appreciation of what is written in that book as being important. I think has added a few life to few years to my already very long life. I feel encouraged to continue uh, as I have in the past to do my best to, to participate in the discussion of what is development in the era of globalization. Um, I think this collection of essays, the book called From the Great Transformation to the Great Financialization, has attempted to introduce Karl Polanyi's ideas into the development discourse into the, into the uh, discussion of various aspects of development, some of which were discussed this morning. Um, I have to tell you that my interest in issues of what was then called underdevelopment, development, underdevelopment, all of these issues that emerged after the Second World War and with the decolonization of Asia and Africa, these interests long preceded my appreciation of the importance of the work of my father. I know that many people would imagine that I imbibed wisdoms from my father from the time as we sat around the dinner table in, in my childhood or youth, but not only did we rarely sit around the dinner table, either in Vienna or in England or anywhere else, um, but like many others here, I learned to appreciate the insights of Karl Polanyi as a political economist, as, a, as an economist, as a professional, if you wish. Because when I was teaching in McGill Development Economics, I think I rarely mentioned the name of Karl Polanyi. And it was not because uh, of any foolish reasons of wishing not to mention him because he happens to be my family. It was because I did not appreciate the importance of his ideas, as I have learned to do since. Um, when I shared my enthusiasm for development issues in the 1950s with my father, he was frankly quite skeptical. Uh, he was always encouraging to, for anything that I may, might wish to do. But you know, he would say in his own way, he said, you know, development, Kari, I, I don't know what that means. That was his way of saying, look, I'm rather suspicious of this. I don't like Rostow. He had a particular, he detested Rostow and his stages of growth and his non, non what is it, non-communist manifesto and uh, what was then the, um, the current literature going around of American origin. And I think it was his fear that the countries that had gained their indep political independence in Asia and Africa uh, would um, follow, so to speak, the American uh, style of capitalist uh, path is what he wished not to see. However, in 1957, uh, and uh, in the knowledge of his mortality and his cancer diagnosis, uh, he wrote to a friend of his childhood, quote, all my, my work is for the new nations of Africa and Asia. 
So he wished his work uh, to, to enter into the discussion, the, the, so to speak, the development discourse. He did not mention the non-aligned movement, but 1957 certainly was a time in which uh, that movement was um, very prominent. So I see the importance of what my Mexican colleagues have done in translating this, this um, book um, as a step toward introducing the thoughts and the ideas and the insights of Karl Polanyi into the development uh, discourse. Um, he, he, he was um, not particularly interested in Latin America or the Caribbean. Um, I suppose he did not think of this part of the world as being, being uh, those regions liberated from <coughs> the European political colonialism in the 1950s. Now, because the title I have given to this little talk is the myth of a what? Of a global market economy and the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. Let me attempt to explain. I think the neoliberal um, agenda and the neoliberal discourse was very clever in understanding the importance of language. And the language which introduced the word global into the discourse and replace, replacing international interdependence, of course, it's, a much ne it's much neater. But when the global replaces international interdependence, international cooperation, in the international in any sense of the word, what is done, it, is to, it eliminates the nation. It eliminates it in the way in which global capital wishes uh, to be freed from what I think it is streak has called, appropriately called, the national cage. Capital is escaping the national cage, meaning it is escaping national regulation, it is escaping politics, because politics, as far as, the, as, far as, as, far as in fact we are re in reality concerned with it, operates at the national level does not operate at any supranational level. That is a myth, the fiction. And I think there that Danny Roderick has explained this more clearly with his famous trilemma of the um, incompatibility of globalization, of strong globalization with national sovereignty or democracy. I have. Uh, I, w I would like to. Sh I would like to suggest that this this is not a coherent lecture you're going to hear. This is more of an effort to outline in 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 15 minutes uh, a sort of research agenda and to leave some ideas to be explored. Leave some ideas with you. I, I have an uncomfortable feeling that the neoliberal discourse has appropriated the internationalism of the socialist movements of years gone by, and by substituting global for international and removing the, what is that? Picture. Picture. Oh, sorry, I thought it was a sign about how many more minutes I have. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> and I couldn't read the number on it. I thought you were telling me I'm running out of time. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's your duty, okay. Well, what I'm saying is, you see that this, the, the word global 
the global information technology, the digital world we move into is attractive to young people. Um, and that's nothing the matter with that. But I think what we are losing, and in, if, it, if it is not deliberate, uh, then it has the same effect of eliminating the concept of the nation. Uh, or if it is not eliminated, then it is to be associated with everything that is backward, conservative, reactionary, or even fascist, or populist, or whatever. Whereas, in fact, we continue our lives, and most of it, we live, we do not live in a global economy. We live, we do live, in a way, in a national economy, because at the level of our country, whatever country we live in, uh, there, uh, there are governments, there are laws, there are institutions, um, social, economic, and otherwise, which provide the framework within which the economy and the society functions. Um, there is no such political framework at the global level. The idea that there could be, well, perhaps, but it is nothing that is uh, in any foreseeable way uh, can be foreseen. Um, and, the sub and the discourse of international solidarity has been replaced, I think, by the liberal discourse. Not, I say liberal um, deliberately of universal human rights, which are individual. These do not have anything to do with states. These are indi indi individual, yes. And it is part of, of our tradition. But it is no substitute. It is neither a substitute for solidarities that exist and are built within countries and nations or between peoples and nations. Um, and I fear that what has, what has happened is that the left, the liberal left, including the social democratic parties of Europe, Democrats in the United States, have um, abrogated responsibility to mobilize opposition uh, to the concentration of capital. Um, by adopting, in effect, so much of the market-oriented uh, philosophy. Uh, and they have they have uh, given to the political right uh, the position of the defense of those classes and sectors and peoples who have been disadvantaged by globalization. That is now very clear and has been said by many people. There's nothing original about saying it, but it is nevertheless true uh, that what we call what is what is called populist um, opposition, anyway, the area, uh, represents the, um, the loss, the sense of loss and the very real loss um, of large sections of the population in all the countries of the advanced capitalist world. It is a loss uh, to the advance of globalization. You see, because the, the impact of globalization on societies um, come from the outside. The, the, the great um, structures of multinational corporations um, are power structures, economic power structures, which do not have to abide by any rules that are 
or, or regulations by na national governments. In fact, the opposite occurs, as I suggested. They influence quite strongly the um, actions and policies of national governments. So what does Polanyi offer? I think he offers the most effective answer to the famous statement by Margaret Thatcher, there is no such thing as society. I think that his um, insights are pre valid precisely because it, he insists on the fact that society does exist and society is an agent and within society there, there are the, um, the, the counter movements of which he speaks uh, come as movements within society to protect against the um, disintegrating forces of monetary, financial, market transactions of uh, winners and losers, and of course, where the strong are always the winners. Yeah, what? How many more minutes? Oh, the, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm okay. We'll, we'll switch to the next topic. <laughs> oh no, this is awful. The, um, when I say the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. Um, it is amazing to me how few people discussing development are conscious of the fact that a mere 200 years ago, it's not very long ago, 200 years ago, 1820, China's production at purchasing power valuation, which is the only one which can compare across countries, was equal to that of all of Western Europe and Eastern Europe and all of the Russian Empire put together at about 33% of world, of world output. So when China is now returning to the, to the world economy, it is now returning to Eurasia, um, it is, I think, only the beginning of the return of uh, China. Um, I am now intimidated by the fact I have now only four more minutes, <laughs> but um, I wanted to share with you and to point to you that I think the reading for this part of the lecture um, is Deepak Nayar's wider lecture, but particularly his book called Catch Up which is really what de economic development in many ways is really about, and the amazing uh, um, rate at which particularly Asia, developing Asia, uh, is uh, catch, catching up. And uh, not only in the fact, in the manufacturing sectors, which are now um, much more important than the export of primary or, or processed primary products, but in moving toward the high end, technologically high end of that sector. Um, I wanted to talk about the Bennington lectures, the five lectures that my father gave in Bennington in late 1940 before setting out to write the book. I would like you to all of you, please, it is worth reading these. You can find them on a website called Prime Economics. Um, it's a site established by Anne Pettifer and her associates of post Keynesians. Um, and in that, I can remember one sentence verbatim and I've quoted to you. And he said, Modern nationalism, meaning the nationalism of the 1930s, is a defensive reaction to the problems inherent in an interdependent world. And this was his explanation uh, of the reactions in Europe where 
the conflict, and I think ultimately the conflict between capitalism and socialism, or certainly the conflict between big business and parliamentary majorities of socialist parties, um, led the capitalists to prefer um, Hitler and other similar uh, rulers to they were ready to sacrifice democracy in order to save, if you wish, uh, capitalism. And um, the reason why Polanyi has returned, I think, to such prominence are precisely in, ter in terms of the explanation of the, um, uh, the, the politics uh, which um, of, of popular of populist opposition. I wanted to finish the talk. I suppose I'm over my five, three minutes. <laughs> with with the, the very interesting idea um, that we are living in a period of interregnum. The, the phrase comes from Gramsci. It was picked up by, um, by ba um, Bauman. Sigmund Bauman, uh, who wrote so beautifully about the uh, liquid society, about the dissolution of solidarities uh, in terms of uh, identity politics that uh, destroyed a lot of solidarities in our economies uh, in the advanced countries. And it is used also by um, Wolfgang Strick, who in my opinion, remains, if, if there is one single person who comments on what is happening currently, I think his are the most insightful and uh, readable uh, comments. Uh, the idea being, of course, that an old order is uh, disappearing, collapsing, dying. Uh, it is that neoliberal order that is, a, um, in a way, a reconstruction in a different form of the 19th century liberal economic order that uh, collapsed in the 1930s. But I think it is best understood as a deliberate dissolution of the assist of the uh, compromise of capital and labor that was instituted in those 30 so-called golden years. Uh, neoliberalism is well understood as the, the destruction and dissolution of all those measures that were taken at that time. But I have finally one thought, one other thought to leave with you, and I told you this is um, an agenda of ideas and of directions in which to look. And that has to do with, with the problem it was raised this morning of the technology, the digital technology, the information technology. I think we have so far failed to look this thing, to look at what is coming here. Uh, we, we have a climate crisis, ecological. We have a financial crisis, we are told by many experts that is coming. But perhaps these are small compared with what is coming at the rate with which digital technology and artificial intelligence is replacing work. It is replacing labor. It is, um, as was feared 30 years ago by Vasily Leontiev, who, speaking about technology, which was his subject, of expertise, uh, described the possibility of a society in which 20% of people um, with the information technology, and he's writing in the mid 80s, are uh, able to produce everything that needs to be produced, and the other 80% uh, put out to graze like the horses that were no longer required after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, to pull the uh, plows or to uh, pull uh, the wagons. He said it would take a cultural revolution in order to adjust to that kind of a society. Well, I believe it is approaching rather rapidly. And some people might think anything that 
uh, lightens work, that r reduces uh, work, is always a benefit. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. The fact is that work and participation in, in, in the society and, and work in itself is also something which is normal and natural for us to wish to do. Um, I think, finally, let me suggest to you that we know the most important thing in our modern society is no longer anything material because most basic material requirements by and large are being met. The most, the most desired the most desired thing in our modern society is a good job. It is, is employment of the kind uh, that, uh, that uh, is well remunerated, that has conditions, that is unionized, uh, that is, in a, a, is the kind of work that is disappearing. Um, and economic growth has become a social necessity of a kind in order to produce even that minimum of growth that will somehow assist in the entry of younger people into the labor force. Uh, and so long as somebody can find something sufficiently profitable to balance the risks involved in investing in it, and so long as we can be persuaded to buy whatever it is of goods or services that are produced. The system can go on, but, but, but these conditions, given the inequality of income, given the loss of purchasing power, given the decline of the middle class, given the rate at which technology is destroying employment, uh, that is not, not a solution. And I think those of us who think about socialism, one has to think of a different set of values and a different way of regarding the relationship to society, the economy, we have to go back to some real basics because the fact that artificial intelligence can eliminate a great amount of work um, is, does not make it easier but makes it more difficult. Uh, the challenges are I think to think of how of how we can rid ourselves of the this ru of the rule of the calculation that more is always better uh, that um, sufficiency is uh, not anything interesting and a whole lot of other things and I finally have come to the conclusion if I ne if I need one uh, slogan to sum up what I believe I would say to all those who are fascinated by the digital technology, a simpler life is an easier life, a better life. A simpler life is a better life. We wish to be more simply and directly connected with nature and with people. Uh, yes, we have to live with the artificiality of the digital uh, revolution, of the fact that we almost lose the capacity to do anything with our hands other than work on a keyboard. Uh, these are huge problems, and I'm, I want to thank you for an opportunity to air and share some of my concerns with you. Thank you. Eugenia Correa is Professor of Finance, Development, and Feminist Economics of the Faculty of Economics of UNAM in Mexico. She belongs to a number of distinguished associations, among them including the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's won a number of awards. She has over 140 publications in scholarly journals uh, and uh, in the form of books. Um, Professor Correa will speak to us about abandoning Neoliberal Policies Under Austerity, South American Lessons of Development Economics. Thank you, thank you uh, for all of us, for all of you to be here today. 
I'm really very happy to share this uh, afternoon with you all, but especially with uh, Kari Polanyi. I'm very proud to be here because she's here, she's here with us. And of course, my teacher, my teacher Ifigenia Martinez, which I really admire deeply, and, and of course, uh, my admiration for these two women that even they con even his age, they continue to, and with uh, this struggle of, uh, and especially to to believe in the in a better life for all of us. Um, I want to start. I don't want to. I want to start this uh, this ten minutes of paper, <laughs> saying that precisely in 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 February of the next year we will uh, have the 170 years of the, of the sign of the treaty, Guadalupe Hidalgo, in which Mexico lose the, more than a half of the territory after the war of, with the United States. The, in one, in, in yes, 170 years ago. And it was signed that treatise by precisely the president, Manuel Peña y Peña. <laughs> is, this, is this not a coincidence or maybe, <laughs> yes or maybe not? But I want to start with this. First, um, well, I take just a, a few minutes more just for a, making a really a short presentation of my paper. Because uh, um, I was, uh, I have uh, several years uh, studied what is happening with the different process in Latin American countries, especially in the South countries, and the the break that they that they did it with the neoliberalist policies, and they started with a new with an just with a new project of economy and society, and and right now it is very important to have this uh, uh, inside. Uh, ana analyzes because it is uh, we are we will have a uh, an election presidential election next year in Mexico and we really need to to take the lessons of the South American countries well where, here is the questions that I try to put in my paper and uh, of course, we need to learn what is happening, what happened with those countries, uh, not only politically but also economically. What is what happened uh, uh, if it is just a political pendulum, or we have, or we can take some uh, important lessons for policymakers in the next future, especially for Mexico. But we need to look a little, a little deeply this experience. I take this, these countries, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Venezuela. I discuss in the paper why I take these countries and don't take another country, let's say Chile, for example, that someone can ask to me that. Well, all, o all over this, um, these uh, movements uh, against the neoliberalism is try to, to restart uh, a little or strong sovereignty over the territory, over the economics, over the politics, over every single, and the, main, the major actors of these uh, countries really, really need this uh, restarting this uh, a, a sovereignty project in economics for their countries. It was not only a popular demand, but it was also a demand of the elites, of some part of the elites of, the, of those countries. Well, I, I include in my presentation uh, some uh, indicators, but maybe I need to just to give <laughs> just
just take the, the conclusion of the, all the analysis that I did it with the statistics that I have. And these uh, left governments uh, that really uh, try to reestablish sovereignty over the res natural resource, over the territory, etc., cetera, uh, make some advances and make some uh, really uh, cl clear skills that in these uh, projects. First of all, the advances, of course, was the stabilization, because most of those economies and countries uh, came from a huge story of unstable governments and economy. Then they, they uh, restart uh, growth, which is, was very important in a different degree, of course. More, it was m more important for Bolivia or Ecuador than for uh, uh, Brazil, for example. No, they restart the control of the corruption, that was uh, very important. Maybe you now say Brazil, we have a lot of a lot of example of good, uh, good examples of corruption, but the corruption that they confront is, uh, when they start in this uh, process was uh, more deeply and really uh, inside all the population, and they restart the control of the corruption. This, uh, of course, tried to go deeper in democracy, and it really they have, some of these countries have this, uh, Constitutional, constitutional uh, assemb assembly, which give a uh, new constitution and new organization of the states and even uh, new institutions that create uh, some uh, deeply opportunities of, for more democracy, especially for some local movements, indigenous movements, and also for, for the elites. Well, they have also uh, some kind of uh, limits that they couldn't stop. They, well, they, all of them achieve uh, better income distribution, which was very important. Uh, uh, reduce the poverty, which is also very important. But at the same time, they couldn't manage them. The, project, the economic project, that they really make more stronger the project in, as, a, as a commodity exportation, primary commodity exportations. Also, in the main point, it was that they couldn't move outside the austerity policies, especially monetary and fiscal policies, which really reduced uh, a lot his opportunity to, uh, co to construct a, a sovereignty project. Some of them uh, go very, very, very deeply in the renegotiation of the debt, foreign debt, which was very important, especially for Argentina and for uh, Ecuador, which liberate part of, the of part of the income of the states in order to uh, produce better results in social policies. But they, for example, don't have really uh, very important advantages in, in salaries, which the salaries really grow very slowly if it, if it, did, if it did it. Well, the point here is that the interests of the foreign uh, corporation, especially the large uh, financial corporation, uh, continue growth in, in, Latin, in South America, even with this uh, neoliberal, non-neoliberal governments or left government, especially, for example, in farmland in Argentina and, of course, uh, Brazil and other countries. And we have also the example of in mining, but I have only the, for these statistics just the farmer land. Maybe you cannot see this. Oh, no. Well, this is the uh, prices of the farmland in Latin America, which was uh, the most important growth in the last years, especially after the financial crisis of 2007. Those prices, those prices even grows better 
higher than the, than other uh, commodities like uh, oil or or food. And it shows really the the speculation, the advance of the speculation in the in our territories in South America, even with uh, with um, with non neoliberal governments. Well, uh, I. How many minutes have I? Um, five. Five. Just thank you for remembering. And then I, I, I just uh, f find these uh, words of the in OCD report, and I think that it is very important that they say that there are uh, this uh, strong private interest in the reforms, in the economic reforms that has. Uh, that has that had make it in the in all these in in all these countries also the not only the north also the south uh, but especially all the OCD countries. Well, I want to in the last two minutes to emphasize two things. First, I want the lesson for policymakers that I tried to arrive in my paper after those all these um, short. Uh, short analyzing statistics, etc. First I want there are no possible to have a non-neoliberal non left-wing government with austerity policies. Maybe that it is uh, very obvious for many of Posca nation here, but it is not obvious for many politicians, uh, Mexican politicians, that really uh, need to know, even the left one, that really need to understand that it is not possibilities to have a project, an economic development project in, in Mexico or in other Latin American countries with austerity policies. Second one, that institutional changes are very important for really to have uh, uh, an, um, an economic and politic uh, project, no uh, neoliberal project. And third one, that it, it is demonstrated by the, by the South American countries that foreign debt renegotiation are, and, and capital controls are very important in order to try really to manage them the external constraints of all our economy. The second idea, the second uh, thing, part of that I want to, to underline in my presentation is precisely that uh, we have the honor to have uh, the Caripolangi book at, uh, in, in our journal, Ola Financiera, uh, several chapters, and right now all the book in the in Ola Financiera for all the students in Spanish, for all the students, Mexican and Latin American uh, students, and we are really very happy to to have this uh, this opportunity, and I can say right now that uh, several students in the last semesters of our faculty have uh, a new discover discovered the work with this book, uh, reading this book in our journal, Ola Financiera. Well, that's it, thank you very much. Rodolfo Garcia Zamora is Director of Development Studies at the Autonomous University of Zacatecas in Mexico. Um, he's also a member of several distinguished bodies, including the Mexican Academy of Political Science and the Euro-Latin American Development Studies Network, Celso Furtado. Um, previously, he was professor at the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Mexico and at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. He too has extensive publications, over 100 articles and books, Professor Zamora will uh, speak about the uh, NAFTA and the future of Mexico, agrarian crisis, employment, and international migration. Okay. 
Okay. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be in this conference with the presence of Professor Kari Polanyi and Eugenia Martinez. Thanks to Eugenia, Mario, and Polanyi Institute by invitation. The team that I want the, to present to you is NAPTA, International Migration and the Future of Mexico. The central thesis that I want to share you are next. In 1982, the neoliberal model dismantled rural development policies, concerning a crisis in the countryside, unemployment and migration. Second, NAPTA deepens the crisis in rural abandonment. Migration to U.S. reaches new highest through 2007 is an escape bubble for the neoliberal model. Third, at 2016-2017, Trump economic and political war against Mexico risks depending neoliberal impacts on employment, poverty, and more violence. Fifth, challenger to Mexico, a political change and reorientation of economic model toward employment, income, a stronger internal market, and human security. The original objectives of NAPTA were next. First, remove obstacle to free trade of goods and services among the three partner countries. Second, promote fair competition within the trade zone. Third, foster investment opportunities. Fourth, protect intellectual property rights. Fifth, create efficient procedures to fulfill the pact and to resolve conflicts. And six, established mechanisms for new form of existing cooperation effort to increase benefits. In the case of critical economics like Arturo Huerta, Jose Luis Calva, Oropesa, and others, the main negative future impact of NAPTA will be next. Inequal and surviving negotiation. Second, destruction of the internal and rural market. Third, loss of food sovereignty and massive rural exodus. Fourth, loss of control over the national economy. Fifth, the agreement makes neoliberalism irreversible. It's important to remember the opinion of Carlos Salinas de Gortari in November 1993. Under NAFTA, crisis will disappear forever. It's important after 23 years of NAFTA the importance of China in the trade with the United States. This is the reason why I put in the top side the four partner in NAFTA. In the figure one, we can see how China boost trade grew eight times with the U.S. from 1991 to 2007. U.S. trade deficit grow without a free trade agreement with China. In the, in the case of U.S. exportation in 2015, we're about 1.5 trillion American dollar, with Canada with 18.6%, Mexico 15.6%, China 7.2%, and Japan 42%. In the case of importation from U.S. 2015, we're about 2.3 trillion American dollar, China Aport 48.2, Germany 9.9%, Japan 8.9%, Mexico 8.9%, Canada 2.8%, a negative balance of 763 billion American dollar. Key Mexican trading partner. In the case of Mexico, exportation 2016 were about 719 billion American dollar, with US 80%, Canada 2.8%, China 1.4%, Germany 1.1%. In the case of Mexican importation in the same year, 2016, were about 387 billion American dollar, with U.S. 46.4%, with China 18%, with Japan 4.6%, and Canada 2.5%. Mexico trade surplus with U.S. 
was about 86 billion American dollar. But for other part, the deficit with China, Japan, Korea, and Malaysia since 1993. And one of the explaining of this situation is that Mexico worked like a link in the global assembly and, Macul and maquila manufacturing chain. NAFTA and agriculture, chronicle of disaster for all told. Jose Luis Calva said in 1992 about the asymmetries in public policy, subsidies, and natural resources between especially Mexico and US. The difference in economic, technical, and social regression in the case of Mexico, the real profit for United States and Canada, low growth in per capita income for Mexico, the gap between the partner growth. In the figure number three, we see how the employment grow from 1.2 million in 1998 to 2.5 million in 2014. Real income in Mexico in 2017 is lower than before the NAFTA. Agriculture falling share of national GDP. In 2015, Mexican agriculture fell to 3.1 of GDP a small real increase in agriculture in the GDP, but a smaller share of the pie. This is a reflection of economic, trade, credit, technical, natural, and institution asymmetries. In the North, protection, subsidies, and support. In the case of Mexico, open market, the regulation, and privatization, poverty, and national and international migration. NAFTA, employment and migration. The official narrative about the NAFTA is that represent the lever of economic modernization, employment, and reduced migration. Carlos Salinas de Gotari, again in November 1993, and U.S. visit called for the signing of NAFTA to prevent an invasion of hungry orders from Mexico. And maybe Salinas thought they are dangerous. I know them very well. In 1990, and there were 4.4 million Mexicans in the U.S. Calva said about this process, Mexico needs 9% economic growth over 26 years with full employment by 2014. But in that year, unemployment reached 2.5 million. By 2014, informal workers make up 56.5% of national economic active population. The relationship between migration and economic crisis. Large-scale migration of 100 years in between Mexico and U.S. is product of a structural factor in both countries, geography, history, transnational network. But in the last 40 years, crisis and migration are very linked. 1976, 1982, 1944. Prices, neoliberalism, and migration is a shock absorber an escape valve for the neoliberal consequences of insufficient growth and job creation. NAFTA from 1994 to 2014 produced 10 million of peasants live in the rural areas in Mexico, producing big migration to big cities in the U.S. At 70s, were 800,000 Mexicans in the U.S. In 1990, were 4.4 million Mexicans in that country. In 1994, were 6.5 million, a 2009.3 million, a 2010, 11.8 million, and this year we have in US 12.2 million, and in this big amount, 5.9 million undocumented migrants. Proportional migration of Mexican and US undocumented Mexican in that country in 19 were 1 million. In 1994, 2.0 million, a 2004.6 2004.6 million, a 2005.0 Between 2000 and 2007, largest increase from 4.6 to 7 million, historic peak. Last five years, reduction in the number of Mexican migrants in due to anti-immigrant policies, the 2000 and 2012 economic crisis in U.S., border militarization, violence, higher cost, and deportation. From 2007 and 2017, 3 million of Mexicans were deported from US. 
deportation risk now of 5.9 million undocumented migrants, besides deportation risk of 1.1 million dreamer if Trump finish DACA agreement in next week. The Mexican nation within the United States, there are diverse transnational communities, 36 million of Mexican origin in US, 12.2 Mexican immigrants born in Mexico, 13 million US citizens with at least one parent born in Mexico, 11.8 million US native who identify as Mexican. International remittances in 2016 from US to Mexico were about $26.9 billion. Remittances from 1988 to 2017 were about $384 billion. They represented 30 5% of Mexico GDP. This year, there are 1.3 uh, million Mexican families that live of remittances from US. In this same year, 2017, Mexico will receive $28 billion of remittances of US. Neoliberalism and NAFTA, Mexico pours a migrant factory. Now we are suffering in Mexico the debt economy with 56% of economic active population and informality, 55.3% of 121 million in poverty. In 2010-2014, the poor grew by 2.5 million. Rural poverty is about 61.1% and extreme poverty are 20.6%. 5.7 million poor campesinos, indigenous peasants, are the more fragile social network in Mexico. The more critical situation are 160,000 murders and 33,000 misses in Mexico from 2000 to 2070. This is the reason why myself and other colleagues of Zacatecas University speak the neoliberalism in Mexico is the debt economy, debt of the work, debt of the market, debt of the life, debt of the future, debt of the hope of the young people. So it is necessary a new national project in the face of neoliberal failure and Trump. In 2016, neoliberal failure in Mexico was very clear. The fall of oil price, 26% devaluation, 9.8 billion pesos of debt, they represented 50% of GDP, half a billion pesos in interest payment in uh, 2017, 239 billion pesos cut from rural education, science, technology, and cultural budget, 1.2 billion pesos in interest payment on the 2012-2016 debt. A new national project, in 2017, Mexico way to have an economy grow about 1.8%. Less trade, less foreign direct investment, more deportation, unemployment, and growing of violence through all Mexico. In this process, impair orientation of economic model. is necessary a war economy. It's necessary to produce 1.5 million jobs annually, increase the urgency to provide more jobs, on face national chaos. A strengthening of international ma internal market, producing jobs, more income, well-being, and human security. Policy of national food sovereignty, fewer importation, more jobs, and a stronger internal market. Urgency, reorientation, economic, model toward economic growth, employment, income, and well-being. But the big challenge here is there is necessary a political change. This is the challenge in Mexico today, and especially next year with presidential election. There will be a very special and complex process. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned at the end, you, just, you talked a lot about all the dangers uh, of the destruction of work, basically, through robotization, and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you yourself had been a, an important statistician and worked on issues pertaining to input-output and all that. 
And if you look at how the tendencies in terms of productivity growth in the economy over the last 30 years, they give a slightly different picture <laughs> okay? uh, in the sense that what we see is much lower productivity growth, not higher. Even in the industrial, you know, I mean, you could say, well, maybe in the services sector, we can't pick it up very well. But in those activities where you talk about artificial intelligence, like in the case of robots used in automobile production is a good example, and I know it exists, I know it's important. But when you look at the actual data on that, it doesn't suggest that we're having this growing acceleration of productivity growth, which you would presume would be the case here. Now, so either it is because we're just not picking it up, or there's something fishy about the whole, you know, discourse here that you know, this growing robotization is going to ultimately lead to this new kind of society where only the, the elite will have jobs in the future. I'm not quite, I'm not sure if I totally understood the question. I think the whole business of the measurement of productivity, when the majority of um, activity uh, uh, services, including 20% uh, of GDP or so, roughly 20%, which are um, uh, basically financial services, finance, insurance, and real estate, and 20% of your GDP. Uh, and in the service sectors, uh, the great difficulty, really, of knowing what the hell we mean by productivity as it is measured. Um, so uh, that would be my, um, my response to what appears to be um, a contradiction. Well, in manufacturing, we have a, a very interesting phenomenon that what some people have called the techno-scientific capitalism, that is the companies uh, that are, at the, they are Silicon Valley companies, the, the Googles and et cetera, produce very little employment uh, for the value of the companies, but they do, and they also produce remarkably little fixed investment. So uh, it, it is, um, when you look at it from a real point of view, of uh, low rates of expenditure on actual uh, gross fixed investment, uh, capital investment, uh, low uh, uh, employment created, but they have a very high monetary value uh, I wonder whether that goes to, isn't part of the picture. Now, when you have these studies by um, by Gordon, what's his name? Robert. The, pardon? Robert. Yes, Robert Gordon. Thank you, Robert Gordon, which 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 seem to show um, declining productivity in, a, in a, and not only that, but that the um, the technology of the um, information revolution is different from that of the second or third industrial revolution, which actually produced many very useful products that were genuinely labor saving, obvious example being all the domestic washing machines and uh, et cetera. Uh, the, the, the digital revolution has not produced, has, has not lightened our labor, it has displaced us <laughs> from a place in society in, in the workplace. Uh, so uh, I maintain that there are very, very real differences and of course the obvious fact that the digital revolution uh, produces an exponentially uh, increasing <laughs> strength of its own self because the, 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 the more it enables the faster it enables data to be processed, uh, the faster it, 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 uh, it enables its own growth. Uh, and and I, I, I continue to think that it presents a huge problem. It ultimately pre presents a problem of what kind of society we want to live in and what are the values we wish to live by uh, because 
as um, my father wrote quite um, <laughs> interestingly, uh, we are rich enough not that we do, we're rich enough to be inefficient. We cannot continue to, to think that efficiency, which in e economy uh, is also measured by profitability on the bottom line, is necessarily makes very much sense when we have the technology that can produce physically uh, what, um, all that we need. But the one thing it cannot give us is a lot of our own time. So I'd just like to, 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 to return our thinking to Keynes and, uh, and uh, his prediction that his grandchildren could live in a world where they would work only 15 hours a week. We are several generations on and the hours of work have not reduced. The one thing that our system has not been able to deliver to us is more free time. There is nothing, it, it delivers, as I suggested before, more goods and services than are actually needed. Uh, uh, the content of what is produced is, is a byproduct of the politics and the economics of the system. The, the economics being that of um, nothing is produced that is not profitable, it's capitalism and the politics uh, are equally important, uh, put a very high value on the creation of employment, value for politicians, political value, because it is very much valued by the people. So what is actually produced and how much of it, a lot of it is surplus and it adds to the environmental problem enormously by increasing the throughput of material goods and material waste uh, beyond what is really required. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of uh, more cu questions if you'd like to take the microphone. Yes. Uh, you were speaking about land um, economics and the pricing of land. It's very interesting statistics. There is an issue in Latin America, uh, I guess in the world, uh, which you didn't touch, but it's interrelated, and I'd like to see if you know about it and what you know about it, which is um, the occupation of land in order to create habitational space or to create any kinds of community activities and new settlements on <coughs> fragile, <coughs> environmentally uh, sensitive, lands such as is happening in Mexico City, happening in many parts of um, Mexico and many parts of the world, which people are finding a buffer for their survival in environments that are not even ready, um, but that are providing uh, for new forms of activity and human uh, reproduction. And could you, uh, or would you, or do you think it's a relevant question, uh, give us some kind of idea how this is impacting uh, the relationship between the economy and nature, if you have uh, Is that directed anything. to Eugenia in particular? It would or? be uh, both uh, or, or any of the two. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so thank you. Well, I, I'm not uh, pretty sure if I understand very well your question, but it is true that in Mexico, especially in Mexico City, we have a problem with a high density of population that we don't have in all around the country. In Mexico, in Mexico City, we have 1,700 uh, uh, persons by, kilo, by, kilometer, by, by kilometer square. And also, but all the rest of the country, you can, I don't know, conquer the, conquer the territory with a few people there, let's say Colima or other states of, the, of Mexico. We don't have a really a, a huge population well distributed because of course the economy is not well distributed, the income is not well distributed, and we don't have this, uh, we have a lot of problems with this territorial, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, distribution and occupation all, all around the country. But at the same time, I don't. I think that the the, ma the major problems in in about this relationship between population and and nature environment it is the, the exploitation of of course of oil in the 
Gulf of Mexico, that maybe it could, it could change the name, but Gulf of the United States, I don't know, <laughs> but maybe. And then, and, and of course, uh, the minority exploitation, which create a lot of, maybe Rodolfo Garcia Zamora can say it, a lot about that, uh, that point. Thank you. Rodolfo, do you want to respond? Eugenia said about the constitutional reform in America Latina to be able the useful application of neoliberalism. This is the case of Mexico. We have a big environmental problem. There are about 300 big national environmental problems as product of the big mining, the big agriculture project, the new producing energy, energy of oil industries, and the capacity of the Mexican state is very reduced because the logic is the logic of the market. And the consequences of these 300 environmental problems are a very big social problem in the south, in the center, and the north of Mexico. So the big challenge next year is what is going to happen with Mexico at the next decade if the model will be the same. And the explanation is the chaos, is the destruction of the nation, the destruction of the environmental, and destruction of the future of the country. Could I have yeah. a word? I, I'd like to suggest that, these, that this is one aspect of the fact that what we have arrived at is very different from a capitalist economy of the conventional kind that produces um, products and exploits labor for the sake of making a profit. We are very much into a financialized rentier economy. And I would think financialized being that 20% of the GNP that accrues as income to somebody with it in salaries, in bonuses, in profit, in, in whatever, that produces very little real use value, but a lot of money income, which money income has to be spent or saved or in invested in or whatever against the, pro the production of the real economy, against the productive activities of those sectors of the economy that pr actually produce uh, use values. And then, and then we have the, the Ronte, um, if effect uh, that not only uh, of the actual physical land grab, agricultural land, of the uh, what is happening to urban real estate, of the enormous uh, speculation which to drives up the value of that real estate. Uh, we have the extractive uh, activities of, of mining and of um, industrial agriculture, which in many ways uh, collect uh, rent, uh, it's not, and then we have the new phenomenon of, of um, the private ownership of, of, um, of technology, of all the, uh, the, uh, the rents that are collected, and this very much pertains to the information technology, the Silicon Valley effect, because it's, it's all about the ownership of the technology, of the trademarks, and, and the income that derives, the property income, is, a, is of a rental kind. It is not, it is not um, profit as much as it is a, a form of rent. Uh, so I, I, I see a whole, and, and that of course affects the, um, the inequality and the accumulation of income at the top, to the point where a lot of that money doesn't know what, what it can do other than <laughs> engage in further financial or, or rent extraction act activities. And uh, land in that sense is, 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 a, is a real asset which is regarded as a, as a potential source if it is, can be appropriated of, of producing some form of rent. Okay, if I may ask the Concluding question before we finish. Um, I'd like to ask Rodolfo actually um, about the ongoing or the upcoming NAFTA negotiations. Just uh, yesterday, uh, Christia Freeland, Canada's trade minister, announced 
Canada's negotiating position, which included incorporating uh, climate change and feminism into the position. Both of these are very uh, uh, noteworthy and, and, and uh, uh, you know, supportable propositions, but uh, against the Trump administration? I mean, what was she smoking? You know, that this, <laughs> this, is going, this is going to go anywhere at all. So um, I guess my, given, given your critique of how disastrous NAFTA has been for Mexico, w w would it in fact be a disaster if there was abrogation, if, if NAFTA were to end through this negotiation? And well, this was the first question in the morning with uh, my colleague Margarita Camarena and uh, our colleague of Korea. What is going the impact of the new negotiation of NAFTA? And quickly I answered, they are making the same mistake of the first negotiation in 1992 to 1994. Because they are uh, making the negotiation with asymmetry situation and they are subordinated. And besides, in the agenda are only the objectives of the big transnational of Mexico and US. And they, they are not considering the impact of employment. They are not considering migration. They are not considering uh, energetic and environmental impact. So if the logic of the negotiation is the same, the impact negative will be deepen how we are producing. And I, uh, I agree in the, the before question. Why we have 12.2 million of Mexican in US? Because the regional economies were destroyed. Because the, the peace economy is destroyed. Because it's, there is not enough employment. 60% of Mexican workers are in informality. And with the NAFTA renegotiation, the same model will be deepening the debt economic model. OK, um, on that note, uh, since we have to be at the Mexican consulate uh, within an hour, and we have, some of us have to organize taxis and so forth, I'd like to bring this session to an end. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite an, a round of applause for our speakers. And, and thanks to all those who contributed to the discussion. I know there's some people who have further questions, but you'll have an opportunity to do that at the reception and into this evening. So thank you very much, and thank you to both Concordia University, to the Carl Plani Institute, and, and, to and to UNA, most of all, our, our Mexican friends for making this possible. Thank you.